Hello, hello, everybody. How is everyone doing this glorious afternoon? Um, so first thing that you're going to notice is I know this is Just Ethan, but the problem is Just Ethan isn't here. And I'm not going to be as attractive and intelligent and as funny as he is, but I am absolutely hoping that you are going to uh, accept me anyway. So um, I know some people are going to click on expecting to see Ethan. Ethan could not be here tonight. Um, he's definitely going to be back for the next scheduled just Ethan, but I am going to sort of be uh, the person that steps in and hosts today's live stream. So before we jump on into it, I just wanted to welcome everybody this afternoon. We're the International OCD Foundation and this live stream, Just Ethan has been part of what kind of started out of the COVID response, but got such good response that we've been doing these virtual town halls, not only to interact with the community, but to make sure that some of your questions get answered and you know the education gets out there. And as always, this is being recorded. So the good news too, is if you have to drop off early or you could, didn't make the beginning or anything like that, you can absolutely watch Watch this in full on the ISDF's social media. Before we jump in and get started, I see Dave and they say I'm awesome, which I am so happy and I didn't even have to pay Dave. So that was really, really kind. So thank you. Um, so there, as you notice that we are on multiple platforms and if you put in your questions in any of those multiple platforms, we will answer them. Today's topic is about a subtype of OCD known as ROCD is what most people in the community call it, but relationship OCD. So if you have questions, if you have comments, lived experience, et cetera, you have any feedback um, that you'd like to put out there for it, absolutely, please put a comment um, in the comment section, a question, et cetera. We'd love to read that. We want it to be interactive. We want you to feel like this is your show. So we'd love to hear questions from you. Brandon said, hi, we love all the people saying hi. Um, looks like he's on YouTube, um, Dave's on Facebook. So it's great that this is across platforms, but this is your show, please comment. We'd love to answer your questions. We'd love to get you involved. If you do have any questions that aren't relationship OCD related and there's time towards the later uh, portion of this live stream, we will absolutely get to some of those as well. So if you're watching it and you're learning about relationship OCD, you can definitely do that as well. And I always tell people, even if you don't have relationship OCD, it's great to watch something and get educated on a subtype because as we know, OCD has a tendency to kind of squirm into other areas over time. And so just good to, to know about it. So uh, I first just want to mention that today's live stream is designed to educate the community, support the community. But what it's not designed to do is to diagnose or treat anyone's obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. So we really ask that you uh, recognize that if you are in a crisis, if you are in a situation where you're not okay, that this isn't the platform for that. We're trying to do as much as we can, but if you are struggling or in a crisis, please instead contact the number below um, if you're feeling su suicidal or unsafe as you have options, obviously calling 911, making sure to go to your local emergency room or the suicide prevention hotline. So please keep that in mind if you're finding yourself triggered or struggling with this, that this is more to educate. We have some incredible people educating today, but it's not designed to diagnose or like I said, uh, be a solution if you're, you're, if you're really struggling. The other thing that I wanna mention is we are going to try to make this as safe of a space as we absolutely can. This is a great community, the OCD community. So we're gonna hear you, we're gonna be supportive. Um, also, if you ask a question, you uh, this is being recorded. So just kind of keep that in mind, but we're gonna do as great as we can. We have an amazing team at the IOCDF uh, making sure that this is a safe space. So I wanted to jump in and introduce my guests. I'm absolutely excited. I'll introduce myself last, I'm not very important, but I'm really excited about our two guests today. So I'm gonna introduce them first and then I'm gonna let them kind of jump in and add anything that I missed. So we have two uh, guests on today. So the first guest that we have is Guy Duran. He is a researcher and a senior lecturer at the School of Psychology, its Interdisciplinary Center, the ID, at IDC, at Herzilla. We practiced that ahead of time and I butchered it, so I probably butchered it now. He earned his PhD in clinical psychology at Melbourne University. I think that's Australia and I'm very jealous because it's the greatest place on the planet. Uh, <laughs> Professor Duran has published 70 papers and book chapters and received several prestigious research grants, including the Marie Curie Reintegration Grant, the Israel Science Foundation grant, the US Israel Binational Science Foundation, and the, uh, and the From Israel Innovation Authority. 
Professor Duran has specialized in obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. Together with Dr. Danny Derby, he identified an additional dimension of OCD symptoms, relationship obsessive compulsive disorder, ROCD, and he's the founding director of the Relationship Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, uh, disorder Research Unit, known as the ROCD-RU, ROCD.net. In addition to his clinical research, Professor Duran has worked in developing and researching innovative internet-based tools for, for clients and therapists. And he's the co-founder of the GGUTUDE platform. I'm going to let everybody uh, correct my butchering after this. Um, he is one of the most research-supported mHealth platforms for mental interventions. So absolutely welcome you on. Hope you're doing well. All Thank right. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see you. All right, so our second guest is Dr. Danny Derby. He is a licensed clinical psychologist with a doctorate in the area of human sexuality. He, his early work focused on post-traumatic stress disorder and sexuality. He co-authored the book New Horizons and the Treatment of PTSD. In the past decade, together with Professor Guy Duran, he identified and studied the relationship obsessive compulsive disorder, ROCD, dimension of OCD symptoms. Dr. Derby published numerous articles on the subject and took part in the development of the treatment for ROCD. Dr. Derby is the founder and director of Cognitica, the Israel Center for Cognitive Behavioral Therapies. The center is committed to the advancement and dissemination of evidence-based practices, and the co-founder of New Horizons an intensive CBT daycare program for people with OCD, anxiety, and depression. So hello, Dr. Derby, how are you doing? Hi, very good, very excited to be here. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely, so how much did I butcher? You guys can totally call me out and I will be okay. Did I pronounce everything right? Did I do okay? Totally fine, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, well, it's great to see both of you. I know I gave you guys extensive um, backgrounds, but do you guys wanna give maybe just um, uh, you know, introduce yourselves yourself, and then also maybe just give a quick kind of how you um, got involved in the study and the, the kind of conceptualization, et cetera, of ROCD. Maybe you could start, um, Dr. Derby. Um, I really have nothing to add. You mentioned so much. So, uh, um, maybe I will talk about how we started, uh, how we started with the research. Uh, I think uh, Guy and, and I met in a um, um, training in uh, in a, a convention, and we started talking about a, a phenomena that we saw uh, with clients, and um, it happened that both of us uh, saw clients that uh, suffered from something that seemed to us like OCD that was focused on relationships. And uh, initially, it was around uh, 10 years ago, we started a meeting and conceptualizing what we saw. And it was very interesting because we, uh, when we started looking for information about relationship obsessions, we couldn't find really any information written about it. But what we could find was actually that uh, people defined themselves as suffering from relationship OCD. And, and we thought that was something unusual. Usually, you know, we have experts defining problems. And here we had people with problems who define themselves. And we just uh, joined in and started developing and, and uh, interviewing people and actually developing the questionnaires. And Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and I'm going to let you talk in a second because I want you to introduce yourself as well. Um, but you know, we, it, it's so interesting sometimes how the community will come together if they see something missing, um, and be able to put that out there. But obviously we need, you know, researchers and clinicians like you to be able to take those, uh, subtypes and really put them out to the masses and make sure that all the, the professionals out there that are treating the disorder understand the subtype, because I'm sure, and we'll probably get into it. There's been so many people that have suffered from that you know, in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, when this wasn't really a term and probably most likely got mistreated, misdiagnosed and didn't get the care that we would need. So thank you for introducing yourself. And then for you, my good sir. Uh, yeah, I don't, Chrissy, you did such an excellent job. I don't have uh, much to add as well. And thank you. Um, and yeah, just uh, carrying on from Danny. Yeah, it's it started as a Basically, when we started seeing it, uh, or we started discussing uh, individuals that seem to have 
some kind of form of obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms um, kind of focused on interpersonal relationships, there wasn't really a lot of information out there. Um, and it was indeed the term ROCD is not the term that we kind of made up. It was the term ROCD is the term that, like you said, it's because uh, uh, Danny, it's like a grand uh, grassroot kind of term. And then, indeed, like you, you said correctly, Chris, we started kind of systematically assessing it and building and conceptualizing it and uh, trying to, to see what we can do about it. And I think you're so right to say one of, one of the needs that we felt was uh, really strong is exactly the need to make sure that people don't misdiagnose ROCD. So there are many... Uh, initially, people went to, uh, you know, to psychiatrists, to psychologists, and they said, listen, I'm not sure about my relationship. And they said, uh, okay, if you're not sure, just forget about it, you know, <laughs> or something like that. And or they went to a couple's, a couple's therapy, and then they treated the problem as a couple's problem. But it's not. It's not a couple's problem. It's a, an individual problem that has ramifications uh, which are related to the relationship of course but um, I think because we saw all these um, kind of mistreatments uh, that didn't help in the end because we started getting clients and they started describing their their via de la rosa their their torturous kind of uh, way through the system that uh, Danny and I uh, thought, wow, this is somewhere we, we have to kind of maybe p try and put a little bit input in and, and advance this, uh, this area. Well, thank you for that. I'm about to jump in a question um, that I think is a good question to start. Where, where are you both located, by the way? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, Israel, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. I... I that's so cool that you're with us. I, that's what I love about this. There's such an international community, not only with people suffering, but also uh, clinicians and researchers. So we're so excited to have you um, all the way from over there. The first so question. If we, oh, oh, go on. If we look a little bit sleepy, it's because it's uh, 1.20 in the morning in, in Israel now. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. I am so Thank sorry. I'm, I'm in LA and it's like 4.20. So yeah. <laughs> very different times. How do you pronounce your last name? Because I know I'm going to, I have an American accent and it sucks. So how do you pronounce it in a Israeli accent? Uh, mine, Doron. Doron. <laughs> Okay, yeah, don't wrong. hard one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hard one. It's all good. I think the good place to start, we have a question at 4.13 p.m. from Jennifer Jordan, and she asked, what is our OCD? So if you were to explain it maybe to the community at large, just so that it's very kind of like to the point and somebody's watching this and maybe they're questioning their, you know, they have OCD, maybe some other subtypes, but they're finding out that they also, you know, are potentially struggling with this. How could you maybe explain it to somebody with OCD so that they would understand the main components of the disorder for, from the subtype? Yes, that's the most uh, important part. But, uh, you know, when we studied the, the, the phenomena and we interviewed the people, we identified, in a way, two routes that it can go uh, by, and it can be, of course, combined. One is actually relationship focus. So the focus is, in the, is either on the quality of the relationship. Is it the right relationship? Do I love my partner? Does my partner love me? So that's one area that people can obsess about and try uh, to reach a conclusion using doubts. The other one is, is related to you know, attributes uh, and uh, you know, qualities of the partner. So that could be uh, looks or that could be morality or that could be social uh, abilities or attractiveness and many other things that are related intelligence to the partner. So, you know, we see those two presentations that are very common. And, and you know, the idea is that it has to, uh, you know, people tend to... Uh, want to reach a conclusion and in a way they use a lot of uh, compulsions uh, that include uh, doubts and reassurance seeking and information seeking and monitoring their internal states 
um, you know, trying to reach a conclusion about the feeling. So we do see, the, you know, something that, that fits the model of OCD with, with obsessions and compulsions that are uh, specifically related to the relationship. And Professor Daron, maybe you could jump in um, and just give an example, like what would be maybe some common obsessions? Let's say somebody's in a relationship. What would be some obsessions that if somebody's watching this, they would want to be looking out for? And then what are, I, I know you can't obviously give everything, but what would be some, some typical compulsions we'd see in response to those obsessions or those fears? Okay, so first of all, I want to, to state that it's important to note, like everything in OCD, and I think in many other disorders, the symptoms are on a continuum, okay? So people that don't have uh, ROCD also have doubts every now and then about their relationships or the suitability of their partner. Uh, and sometimes they also, uh, you know, they have preoccupations around the intelligence of their partner. Or they're not sure about their looks or, or things like that. But that's not ROCD. ROCD, when it becomes disabling, and the preoccupation and doubts are, are daily and for hours and hours on end, and it's very distressing and it hurts uh, their kind of capacity to function in, in other areas of their lives often. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just an important note to, to make sure that... Uh, so um, an example is, you know, so like, uh, like uh, Danny well said, there are two kind of main dimensions that we talk about or presentations in ROCD that we talk about. So that's a relationship centered and the partner focused. So, so the relationship centered is a person that is preoccupied with whether, for instance, they love their partner. Okay. Whether they're attractive, they're attracted enough for their partner, attracted to their partner, whether their partner is um, the suitable one for them or the one for them. Yeah. And they can, for instance, every time that they're with their partner, they're going to check whether they feel, you know, the heart pumping, whether they feel really excited to see them, whether they feel like uh, the, that they communicate really, really well, and they're going to, so that's, thoughts will pop up in their head and say, okay, am I con communicating? Am I attracted, am I attracted to my partner? Is he the right one for me? Is he the one for me? Maybe somebody else is the one for me. Maybe the one that crosses the street is the one for me, etc. cetera. So um, they're going, all these thoughts are going to pop up uh, frequently, and then they're going to do things in order to kind of reduce the distress associated with such thoughts. So, for instance, if they want to assess whether they're attracted to their partner, they're going to kind of monitor their, their feelings and their kind of attraction and their passion, for instance, during, during sex, okay? But not only, but it could be a, also in any interaction. Is my heart pumping and I'm really, really excited to see that person? So they're going to kind of try and check that in, in, in different ways. Yeah, they, they can also kind of look at other potential partners and check whether they are more attracted to them or they or ask themselves why again and again why am i looking at other partners etc they can seek information yeah these are all compulsions seek information on you know in the internet on uh, information uh, if i'm not sure about the right one what should i do how do i test whether this is the right partner for me uh, how do I know that I'm sexually attracted to them, etc.? So these are, for instance, some kind of compulsions with a relationship-centered kind of uh, the, uh, presentation. The partner focus is people that focus on their partner's flaws, like Danny Well said. So intelligence, appearance, social skills, etc. Um, and a client that I once had many many years ago. Uh, she was uh, preoccupied with her partner's sense of humor, okay? And was he funny enough for her? So she always, she, during every interaction, social interaction, she checked whether other people are laughing, whether they're amused by him, whether they feel he's maybe um, not, not socially skilled, etc. And asking for reassurance. 
And self-reassurance is very common. So to say, no, why, why am I worried about that? I know he's, he's a professional. I know he's a doctor. I know he's a lawyer, whatever. But why do I always doubt that he's intelligent enough? Yeah, it's okay. He's intelligent. So kind of repeated self-talk to kind of um, assure yourself in addition to assuring others, etc. So there are many kind of... Uh, yeah, different kind of uh, compulsions and uh, these thoughts that intrude uh, without you wanting them to intrude and making you distressed, basically. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, you you guys really laid it out there for everyone, and that's going to be important because a lot of times people may be experiencing this and not knowing. I, I forgot to interest myself in the beginning. You guys are more important to, to intro, but you know, I'm a clinician that treats OCD here in the Los Angeles area, but... I have OCD and relationship OCD. That's why I was so fascinated to have both of you on. I was really excited is because I have OCD. And for me, um, because my case was so severe, I didn't have really relationships. And so when I really entered my first relationship after treatment, I was done with treatment, never heard of the subtype because I wasn't dating. <laughs> I was housebound um, and I got hit hard. My very first relationship, my real relationship uh, in my early 20s, once I was done, was this. I mean, everything that you guys are locating, and because I didn't know what it was, it was hell. And for me, actually, I didn't find out what it was until I became, I'm, I'm one of uh, the IOCDF's lead advocates now, but I used to be a speaker for their Speakers Bureau. And as they were educating me on talking about OCD subtypes, I believe it was your research was some of the first stuff I saw, or, you know, the IOCDF g gave me information to kind of educate people on the different subtypes. And it, it was then being like, oh my God, this is me. You know, I spent mm -hmm. two years in a relationship constantly like obsessing, am I good enough? Do you know, how do they feel about me? Are they going to leave or cheat? And then vice versa. Like, do I like them? Do I want to be in this thing going back and forth? And I, and I can say like having relationship OCD was hell. It was one of the worst experiences I ever had. I, I would say, and, and maybe you guys can jump in and say, do you hear this from your your you know, clients and for the people you speak for, for me, the relationship was like my all or nothing. I mean, if the relationship was going well, I could go to work, I could go to school, I could function. But if my relationship was doing poorly, I didn't care about anything else. And because I was afraid of the relationship ending, I would quit jobs that took too much time away from the relationship, or I would t not take as many classes, or my, my grades would suffer because I thought I had to constantly be in contact and, and give information. So is that some of maybe the things that you both hear when you speak with clients or, or through the research? You know, you know, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's very time consuming yes. when, when, when you obsess about it. And uh, you know the, the distress that it causes uh, causes a lot of suffering, and and you know and I, I think the problem is that before it was identified as a you know subtype, the problem was that you know you had so many opinions about relationships that you can read in the med media or you can get from you know family members, and if you consult and seek reassurance from other people, even professionals. You know, I, I can say about uh, my first client, I, uh, the, you know, he came and I, he, to me, it was, we did together the rituals. It was a, a lot of uh, checking and uh, thinking about his girlfriend and, you know, and, and before we realized it, and I think this is, this is the important thing that once you identify it as a, as an obsession, you know, you can you can really um, you know once professionals identify it as an obsession, it's something that can you know really really makes a difference. And, and you know you know going back to your question, I think uh, you know we see a lot of people that that you know I, sometimes I see people who are in their sixties, seventies, and you know without identifying it, it literally ru ruins a lot of times their relational, uh, you know, relationships, relational history, families, a lot of times. And, and it, uh, you know, it's, it could be in every part of the relationship cycle. So you were talking about, you know, getting into a relationship. So that could be one problem, getting in. And, and you know, another problem can be, you know, maintaining the relationship. And another problem could be, you know, staying in the relationship and actually feeling joy. Because once you're obsessed, you, you're not in the relationship. Actually, you're not experiencing the relationship. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, everything you're saying, you're speaking to me, <laughs> to my soul. I mean, obviously, I've, I, you know, I'm a clinician now and I've gotten treatment. I'm in management or recovery. 
but everything you're talking about is is absolutely true. I'm going to get to a question in a second, but maybe for you, Professor Duran, can you when when did you guys start to put out your research? Because obviously you saw that it was in the community. I'm guessing at that point there wasn't a lot of research or there wasn't a lot of like you know published papers or anything on this. When did it come around that you guys were able to really help bring the research and like the the evidence base and the science to this? And now we all talk about it as if, you know, we recognize it as one of the, the core subtypes of OCD. So uh, it seems like yesterday, but it's, <laughs> but now when I look at the date, <laughs> it's almost 10 years ago, it's 2012. Yeah. And we put out the first uh, two papers that were around the relationship OCD. And I have to say that uh, the way you describe your suffering, it's, uh, it's, uh, First of all, I'm sorry to hear that you went through that, but we do have many people that, like you, until they understand what they have, they they just don't they they don't know what it is, and they don't realize that it's a, a treatable problem. And I think that's a, and often they think, okay, so so it's a little bit too much. So maybe the next one will be okay. The next partner will be okay. Um, Maybe it will pass with time. And like this, uh, sadly and unfortunately, many people go through, through their lives of, through many years until they kind of realize, and also often by chance, because ROCD is not a well-known phenomena yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to put it out there as much as we can, but we, just in an, an anecdotal um, um, story, um, about two years ago now, I think, somebody um, came to Israel um, and, uh, and while he was visiting, he gave me a call and he said to me, listen, I've been suffering from this problem for, for years and I live in the States and nobody heard about it, okay? And that was all two years ago about And he said... Listen, I want to support you in any way we can. And one of one of the things he did is uh, gave us money to develop um, to develop our online program, just to get more and more dissemination, and for at least people or also therapists that want to know more about the, uh, more information and more information about how to treat RSD, um, uh, to to have a resource for that. So. Yeah, I think knowledge about it, and 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 thank you for, for thank you for kind of hosting us because I think this is a great step uh, in kind of disseminating information about our city and for people to know about it and to know that the there is a treatment, yeah, and uh, people can yeah. can be helped, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I love Ethan to death and, and, and I'm so glad to step in for him, but I am absolutely glad I was able to step in because honestly, you guys, like for me, relationship OCD, I don't even know if my therapist at the time knew what it was. And I know for me that if it wasn't for your, your guys' work, because I, you know, obviously I had to do background research on you guys before I talked about you guys and stalked a little bit, but it was really the things that you guys put out there. I mean, I'm telling you, like I, I suffered for almost three years after treatment, not thinking this was OCD. I, you know, I, I started with the, the checking and the contamination, got a lot of uh, magical thinking. And then when I was in treatment, a lot of harm and sexual intrusive thoughts were kind of the core in treatment uh, along with the old stuff. But we didn't even touch the relationship OCD. And I can look back at all the subtypes and I would say that one was the hardest um, because I didn't know what it was. And, and, and I, I will never forget, it's like after suffering for three years and I'm working with the IOCDF and getting the information, I'm about to go speak at a conference and I get this little, you know, pamphlet from you guys, you know, the stuff that you do on ROCD. And it wasn't until then that I was like, oh my God, that's what I'd have. I was able to get better. I was able to use the same strategies of ERP that I did for the other treatment into the relationship OCD. And then my second relationship was so much healthier. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you guys. Uh, but it's not about me. I want to jump into the questions. We're getting a lot thank now. Thank you also for sharing that. Yeah, yeah no, I, it, it's so funny. I didn't realize it was you two who did that until um, and I know you guys have an article on the IOCF website um, mm -hmm. that I've read before, and it talks about the two major types of ROCD. 
Um, but I'm telling you, like, I really didn't know what this was until you guys put out your research. And then when I was with IOCDF, like reading that, so fangirling a little bit, but no, you guys really, I mean, just that knowledge and understanding that it is OCD and it can be treated with ERP was game changer. Now my relationships since then have been healthy. Um, and they weren't when I was struggling with, with the OCD. So thank you guys. Um, I want to go to 422. Um, first of all, Nick Toth has a question. We got to get to him. He shouted out your organization, Professor Duran. I think he sees the name in the background. So he said the GG Tude. So probably a bunch of that. Um, so Jessica Fletcher, and actually it's two people asked this question. So Jessica Fletcher back at four minutes and 22 seconds. I think this is a good question. Can this subtype manifest in other relationships? So like between parents and children, and then Mad Witch um, asked the same question. Is it possible to have ROCD with like platonic friends or family members such as uh, parents or siblings? So do we see that in any way in other kind of platonic or uh, relational, you know, family relationships as well? Danny, you want to talk or should I? Okay, so yes, we do. We do, um, and we have some uh, research published about this. So uh, that's also an interesting story. So I once had a, a client that um, he had ROCD towards his partner, and then as time went on and he had a child with his partner, he started also obsessing about this child. And this is the first time, at least for me, that I even thought about the possibility that uh, individuals can obsess not only about their partners, but also about their children. And we have some research showing that, yeah, indeed, um, individuals have ROCD about their children, for instance, about their flaws. They start obsessing about their, their flaws, uh, their potential flaws. It can even start from, we have now a, a, a paper under review showing that it can even start directly after after birth. So it can really start really early, but it continues until there, some, it continues. So it can, uh, so we have some studies showing that, you know, with, uh, with Italian students, um, our collaborators there collected information about how their parents obsess about the students. And you see that it's very distressing for parents and it can really impact the, the, the person himself, the child, um, the fact that his parent obsesses about either their kind of potential, their flaws, uh, it could be physical flaws. Um, by the way, in parentheses, I even remember that my mother, when I was a child, <laughs> and that's something I just, in retrospective, she she had a, um, a, a problem uh, with her a little bit with her own bottom so she used to also uh, criticize my own when i was really young so it was a, a really interesting now when i think about it wow i'm thinking oh, that's kind of she was there on the continuum in that sense and it also leads us to the the, the relationship between a little bit between bdd or being preoccupied with your own problems uh, with your own physical problems uh, often, and they, that can also kind of translate to being preoccupied with your partner. But back to your question. So does the parent-child, does, does, it does exist. Um, and we now research between individual and God. So also individuals, would, they can obsess about their relationship with God, for instance. Um, now we're starting to uh, study also child towards their parents so a child obsessing about um, their parents flaws or their relationship with their parents we don't uh, I, we don't have data on that yet because we just started doing that but the idea is that it is it can definitely translate to other areas or even start with other areas and it can be also with friends and uh, in other contexts Danny you Especially with teens, I can say that in the clinic we saw, you know, many cases of teens who are. So this is this is something that uh, we often see. So so in a way, it does cover, you know, relationships, and and you can obsess either way. You know, you can obsess about your parents; they can obsess about you. It's a. Uh... 
Yeah, it can get complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I was going to add to that. So I know, you know, looking back on relationship OCD, I mean, for you were talking about teens, Dr. Derby. I mean, when I was in high school, for me, definitely now can recognize relationship OCD, but it wasn't about the relationships I was in. It was my friends, you know? So one of the compulsions I would do is like after a party, I would like mentally know if I felt there was any interactions that I didn't think were like up to par, you know, do I think this friend isn't going to be my friend anymore? And so when I'd go to school that Monday, it's like, I'd make sure to bump into those people deliberately and be like, yeah, the party was so great. Right. And to get that reassurance, like, yeah, I had a good time with you. Right. Yeah. I had a good time with you too. Like I, I saw it, uh, you know, for that reassurance mm -hmm. that our friendship, they still liked me. They weren't, cause that was my core fear. Now looking back was that these friendships were going to fall out and they weren't going to like me anymore and hang out with me. And just, it wasn't this idea of like this gradual, like falling apart. It was literally, if I didn't do the right thing um, for the relationship. So if I wasn't as fun as I was last time, or if I didn't talk to him enough at a party that they just the next day were going to be over me and not hang out. And so that's where I can identify the relationship OCD for me started. The relationship romantic obviously came after treatment, but prior to treatment, I had a lot of obsessions and then physical and mental rumination compulsions around my relationships uh, with friends that were platonic in high school. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm glad that question. Um, I think it's Addie Cohen says, thank you for the self-exposure as a therapist with OCD. I think it's always important as a clinician to open up about just my lived experience. I know um, it helps people just relate. And I'm glad they asked a question about platonic because I think a lot of people think of relationship OCD as romantic. Um, but I know that I see clients that have it with siblings or with parents. Um, but for me, it was definitely friends in high school. Uh, the next question I want to jump into is at four minutes, or sorry, at four uh, thirty-one p.m. my time. I always forget that Fran is in our time. But uh, Marlene Edelman wants to know: Is there a common underlying fear that people with ROCD have? Does addressing that fear help? And then, what do you recommend for for ERP? So, the first part of the question, it sounds like you know, did everybody that you researched and you see do they have kind of the same core fear underneath? And is it important to address that? And then, the second part is like, what would be an example of maybe some ERP for that uh, core fear or anything that's underlying? Um, you know, the the way I see it, I think they are common, but not necessarily the same. And the idea is to explore, you know, specifically what is the core fear of the client. But when we, you know, normally when we talk to people, I think a lot of times it's, it's a catastrophizing of the future. So in a way, the catastrophizing of the future is I will be either stuck in the wrong relationship and, and you know, the, the, the fear is that uh, I will miss my, my life, my children will suffer, uh, uh, my, my, I'm misleading my partner. So that's another thing that we see. Um, so that's one of the things. And the other direction could be is actually the fear that I will leave the relationship and that would be a mistake. Mm. Or, you know, either, either direction is either I will be in the wrong relationship and a lot of suffering would come out of it and I would, you know, miss my life, mislead other people, my children would suffer, or I would miss my life, you know, I will not be able to find another relationship. And, you know, a lot of times in terms of exposure scripts, you know, it's like being a bag lady <laughs> with a lot of cats and, and lonely, you know, if you leave the relationship. You know, I think, for me, working on the script is is, is usually for your know, imaginal exposure scripts is a day in your life somewhere in the future, and uh, you know, imagining coming home for work and you know meeting your partner and and you know we sit in the table and she's so boring, and uh, you know we have three fat children and I can't take a look at them and uh, you know they she they, they, her hair is really thinning and you know so. It, in a way, the script is built on the personal, you know, things that the person is preoccupied with and, and you know, what he or she feels that, you know, he would be missing if he stays or leaves the relationship. And we also work with two scripts. So a lot of time therapy would include the script of, you know, staying in the wrong relationship and, and you know, being somewhere in the future or leaving the right relationship and never being able to find. So these are two scripts that we would use for exposure 
uh, imaginal exposure. Um, Guy, do you want to add? No, I think it's a really nice uh, description. Thank you, Dan. It's uh, these are yeah, these are definitely core fears. So either live leaving the right one or staying with the wrong one. So it's exactly these are often these are, uh, are are and there's another core fear by the way, which is fearing being obsessed for the rest of your life. Okay, so and that often uh, is also uh, comes with our OCD. So uh, I, if I continue like this, I'm, it's going to be too much for me. Kind of thing. So what I heard is then basically the core fear sometimes is important to find out because that's what you can write those those imaginal scripts around, and that's really where the acceptance comes in. Um, is there ever a fear of? everybody abandoning or is there a fear about being alone i mean i know you talked about kind of being the bag lady with cats do you hear that a lot in individuals with relationship ocd is just that fear of what if i do the wrong thing and everybody leaves or you know is it does it ever get to that as well you know i think both scripts includes a lot of loneliness mm. you know you know, either staying in the wrong, you know, being in the wrong relationship, you, you know, if you are 10 years from now and you're really in the wrong relationship, you would feel a lot of loneliness. And, and, you know, this is one possible future. And that is why we work with it as exposure. But, but, but uh, you know, there are other options. And, and, and yet I think that working with that, working with, you know, being able to accept that, you know, this is one possible future. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> it is very scary. Yeah. And not the one that you strive for, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, fear, fear of being alone, fear of being abandoned. That's something common in, in our OCD. And not only, by the way, in our OCD, it's common in many disorders, but yeah, in our OCD, it's also common. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to jump into Nick Toff's question at 433 in a second. But um, one thing that I hear from a lot of my clients when they were misdiagnosed, one of the things that they get misdiagnosed for is borderline personality disorder or what people you know, know as BPD. And the reason for that is there's that core fear of abandonment in that personality disorder. Um, as you guys continue to put out more research and the community at large and the IOCDF and stuff puts that out there and clinicians are familiarized with it, hopefully people won't get misdiagnosed for the wrong things. But what are the common uh, misdiagnoses that you find people with ROCD get? And then um, how is it different from some of the common misdiagnoses that people receive? You know, I think borderline personality is definitely one of them. Uh, but I think the most common one that at least we saw, and this is, you know, I think this is, I think maybe was our first talk was for the Israeli Marriage and Family Therapy Association. I think a lot of times it's misdiagnosed for relation, relational uh, conflict or problems, and it creates relationship uh, conflict and problems. But I think, uh, you know, addressing it in a, a couple's relationship is not necessarily... Uh, the solution. Um, I think in terms of, of uh, you know, the distinction between uh, borderline and, and uh, relationship obsessions, I think that, uh, you know, for the majority of, of people, it would not, uh, they would not necessarily have the same stormy relationships as BPD. They would have a lot of uh, uh, emotional pain in relationships, but not necessarily the stormy part of it. But there are some people with our OCD that we see, uh, you know, not all of them, but some. For some of the people with our OCD, you know, just right is the issue, and, and we call it just writing your partner. And when yeah. you're just writing your partner, you know, and trying to correct him and fix him and make him be right for you, that a lot of time can create a lot of clashes that actually look very similar to what you see in in BPD. And again, I, I don't think it's necessarily BPD, but that's where it becomes hard to make the distinction because you have the clashes, you have the fights, but the fights are more on the not being right and not necessarily just abandoning. Mm -hmm. 
No, thank you for that clarification. Obviously, the more and more we get this information out, that's why I'm so happy about this live stream today is the more people will get the right diagnosis. I heard in you, uh, Dr. Derby, a question that, um, or, or a comment that I think Nick Toss question at 433 is perfect for, if feelings aren't facts and we're not the authors of our thought, feelings are urges, how does one evaluate their relationship? So obviously nobody can be in a relationship they don't evaluate. Nobody can be in a relationship that's so perfect there's never anything to, to question. But how does somebody with ROCD make sure to maybe decipher between relationship struggles versus obsessions um, and compulsions and you know kind of answering Nick's question how do people balance that um, because it's probably very tricky uh, I think oh, wow that's that's uh, that's a big question I think that's and, a trick uh, question <laughs> it's a <big> question <laughs> yeah and I think that's that's basically the question that people with RSCD they carry. Uh, and they bring bring to to the session. Yeah, how do I know this is the right partner for me? How do I know I'm, that I'm not in the wrong relationship? Yeah, how do I know? And please help me decide. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's often the case. So the first thing is to to understand that in order to to decide. Yeah, and not assess. In order to decide whether you want to stay in the relationship, first you have to experience it. Okay? And I think that's the core issue in our city. In our city, you're basically in your head. You're not experiencing the relationship. You're experiencing your own thoughts and fears of the relationship and of course the compulsions and also the ramifications of your obsessions and compulsions with within the relationship. So the conflict, if it exists, or the distance, or the loneliness, or, or all of the above. So the first thing we do and is try to, um, to work with the client to see how he's really not experiencing the relationship. He's just living inside his head, okay? And as therapy progresses and the obsessions and compulsions diminish, then he can experience and basically see whether he wants to decide or she wants to decide to continue in the relationship or not to continue in the relationship. So indeed, we are not, uh, we, when we are in the, the, the obsessive storm, we can't decide anything, yeah, for many reasons, yeah, but especially because you're not really experiencing the relationship. So the idea is that with therapy, you can diminish all these, uh, these, uh, these waves yeah, and, uh, and experience the water. For, uh, and then you decide if you want to stay in the relationship or not. And I think one important aspect of the therapy as well is after you get rid of the obsessions and compulsions is considering yeah, um, whether this person and everyone has flaws. Yeah, everyone. I'm At shocked that I know. Out. I'm shocked <laughs> yeah. in the South this whole time. My mom told me I have no flaws. So thank you yeah. for ruining <laughs> my uh, amazing <laughs> belief about myself. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a hard, it's a hard one to accept. I know. But especially it's hard to accept also regarding your partner sometimes. But yeah. one one of the the parts of the, the the therapy in the end of the therapy after you get rid of the obsessions and compulsions is thinking about okay what are you willing to accept in your partner and what are you not willing okay so are you willing to accept that your partner is not as quick as you would have liked yeah or as sharp as you would have liked or as handsome or as beautiful as you would have liked or as socially skilled or, or whatever because there are facts you know people are different and each one has uh, you know is strength and weaknesses so in the end of the day you also you'll you'll be able yeah after therapy one will be able to kind of decide what he wants to do i, I hope that that was clear yeah, and, and this question is coming up a lot. I see Madeline Baker asked a similar question um, on YouTube. We have Namita OO 
they both kind of asked how do you you know balance that evaluation of a relationship and critique of a a, a potential mate maybe we can throw madeline baker's question up there and, and maybe a, a a second kind of twist on that is when it comes to evaluation can you maybe give a specific uh that's at 437 can you give a specific example i i know it's hard to come up on the spot but what would be maybe what we would see as a more balanced or non-ocd way of critique critiquing a partner maybe they did something wrong or you're upset and then where would we see it become more obsessions, compulsions, and ROCD? Please, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking. Um, you, you know, I, I mean, I, I want to add something to what Guy said and maybe connect it. Yeah, of course. We, we ask clients initially in the beginning of the therapy, we ask clients to postpone the decision about the relationship. And, and the idea of postponing the decision, so for now, for six months or for eight months, you're not making a decision about the relationship. This is actually harder for people who are not in relationship or have difficulty getting into relationships. And that's a different contract. We negotiate it. But, but, but I think that, you, you know, when you have, uh, I mean, we all have things that we like or dislike about our partner. And, you know, some of these, these things could be big. A lot of times the people we see with our OCD, even if the things are big, they cannot make the decision about the relationship. They're using uh, doubts and using compulsions, you know, uh, reassurance seeking and monitoring their emotions and, and, and reading about, uh, you know, relationships and comparing to other relationships. And they're, they're using this as an attempt to reach a conclusion about the relationship. And what we are claiming, you know, this is not the way to reach a conclusion. And I think a lot of times, I mean, if you are not obsessive about a relationship, it would be easier. You, you know, you have pros and cons of the relationship. And initially when we saw clients and we didn't know it's ROCD, you know, CBT, you have a, a, a partner, you think about the pros and cons and, you know, make a decision, but people can't make the decision. And, and I think this is the point. So, you know, people with ROCD cannot make the decision and they have enough information about the relationship so they can make a decision. And they cannot make a decision because they're using, using compulsions as an attempt to solve the problem. And this is a major thing that we teach them in therapy. You know, you would be able to decide about the relationship once you stop doing the compulsions, then you'll get the clarity that Guy talked about. And, you know, a lot of times for many clients that we see, they stay in their relationship, but also, you know, some of the clients, they leave the relationship, the relationship ends. And, you know, also being able to end the relationship without the conflict and without continuing to obsess is something very important. So I hope it answers. Um, I can add to that. That yeah, of course. Yeah, um, maybe there. Many times there are conflicts in the relationship. Okay, and many times I think for all of us uh, in relationship we have our disagreements and our difficulties. So also when the when we progress with therapy and we let go all of these these erroneous or or maladaptive ways of trying to resolve the question of whether I should stay or go, so which are the compulsive behaviors and the obsessions. We also work about communication, okay? Communicating and how to, to express your feelings and how to discuss a conflict and how to resolve it. It's, it's all a part of, uh, of, 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 the, of the therapy. And many times what in also causes distress is one's inability to communicate their needs, okay? So I think the, the first step is getting rid of all the, the, the compulsions or maladaptive ways of trying to resolve the problem. Then you can really start working better on, on, the, on all the other difficulties that we all have in relationships. And 
what we find is that people with RSED often don't get, they don't have these skills, mm -hmm. okay? Because they were never in an adaptive relationship, they have, they need help also with these, uh, with these skills. Not always, by the way, but uh, many times. Yeah, I was going to add, you know, just from lived experience, I know that when I was in my relationship, when I didn't know what RCD was, and I was, I was definitely consistently having intrusive thoughts about the relationship, I would do a lot of mental rumination, playing things out, a lot of compulsions, checking texts, you know, do you still like me, reassurance seeking. What I felt is that anytime I was critiquing or anytime that I was deciding if this person was for me, it was always very urgent. It was always that there need to be answered now, and it was very all or nothing. So if we had a fight, it was never like, how am I going to repair the relationship? How am I going to get to a point that we can can fix this or we can grow together? It was always a decision. We just had a fight. This must mean the relationship isn't perfect. We need to break up. And then I would have that contemplation of breaking up or we would. It was a very on again, off again relationship because of my, you know, my OCD experience. But um, then it was like, okay, now I'm breaking up. I'm never going to find somebody like this person. I'm going to be alone forever. I'll never find someone as great. I'm going to be thinking about them forever when I'm in my new relationship. And so when I did get the treatment and, you know, utilize DRP for, for ROCD in my healthy relationships after that, if I had a fight or if I had something I didn't like about my partner, it was much more balanced. It was, it was talking to them. It was explaining something. It was accepting their flaws and learning to love the things that maybe when I started the relationship, I didn't love, but I, I grew to it. So that's kind of how I, as a person with, is able to see the difference is one was very urgent. I had to make a decision now and it was always extreme. It was either break up or you know stay together forever. Whereas healthier relationships, once ERP um, you know, really helped me to get, like you were saying, uh, Professor Duron, like getting those those maladaptive thoughts and behaviors out and having more clarity, I could start to say, okay, you know, we're in a fight right now. The communication isn't great. Here's some things we can do to repair it instead of I got to be out. I got to be done. It's over. I think that, first of all, I love your descriptions. They're, <laughs> they're fantastic. You're, oh, thank you. You're really <laughs> amazing. And I think it's a really important point. Uh, you raised many important points, but the one that uh, I, I want to talk about a little bit more is the fact that, it, indeed, in ROCD, everything leads to a question of to questioning the relationship. Okay, so like you describe, any conflict, any, uh, but it's not only conflict. And it's, sometimes it's something that the the partner says, which is not towards you. It was it can be towards somebody else. It makes you doubt whether he's smart enough or she's smart enough. Yeah. So then you say, oh, wait, maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. When you, feel, you look at some other partner, oh, maybe I'm, I'm looking at another partner, or maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. So basically almost, and sometimes it gets to extreme levels that, oh, I'm not in a good mood. Maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. So everything is related. In the end, the, the immediate conclusion is maybe I'm not in the wrong relationship. And then, like you say, there's this urge and this uh, immediacy feeling that you immediately have to decide. Okay, so now uh, if I'm not sure about the relationship, I have to I have to know if I'm in the right relationship. So and then you go into the spin of the the compulsive uh, and obsessive spin. So yeah, I think you 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 exemplified it really well. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to get, I, I know you had talked a little bit, Dr. Derby. There's a, a question from YouTube by Love Lana. Um, I, it sounds like really God. So I, I think what they're asking is basically you had talked about potentially doing some research on people's relationship. That's at 441. Uh, people, you know, doing relationship about people's, you know, if, if people are just tuning in, doing uh, some research about people's relationship with God, having some relationship or some ROCD elements. Can you maybe expand on that? And how is that maybe a little bit different than scrupulosity, for instance? I think this is something Guy could add more about because that's his research. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I know it's surprising, first of all, yeah. And it's really um, what we see now. Okay, so scrupulosity is, is more around fear of uh, being punished 
or uh, by God of fear of sinning. Yeah, so it's around these areas of morality, more like more more centered morality and and such. And what we looked at is a little bit different. Is the relationship with God is whether you feel like you have the right connection with God, okay, or that you're you're you really um, love Him enough, okay. So whether you're in the right relationship. So we try to differentiate and to look whether this is. Um, an aspect that um, can one can obsess about. Uh, the truth is that initially, when we tried to to look at it, we also thought about maybe people obsessive about whether God loves them. But this this one we dropped because people, uh, religious people, at least uh, in Israel, didn't couldn't see that way. They they only saw the the other way, and um, because I'm not religious, and uh, so I didn't think about that but then that's what we realized so so this is the this is the more the aspect it's the relationship with god from your end more from the person's the individual end whether it's the right relationship whether they love them enough whether they're doing enough to show it etc well that's fascinating i can't wait till you put it out i mean it, it if you think about it with relationship ocd as you as you mentioned earlier the, you know people most of the time think about it in a, in a romantic aspect but really starting to think like you know it could be a relationship with anyone um i've had clients that have had relationship ocd with their bosses and not in the normal mm -hmm. like i want to make sure my boss likes me but you know really obsessing like does my boss care about me are we friends are we not friends um how come my boss you know said something good about somebody else and not me does that mean that they don't you know so I, you you could kind of see it in in any situation i could see that um i'd love to jump at 457 uh, for madeline baker asked another great question what would your advice be somebody who's kind of setting out to date in the first place i know madeline had mentioned uh, in a later comment about dating apps which i am so glad that my rocd was at its worst when there was not really like big old dating apps like this um, because I think I would have gone uh, really, really difficult times. But what would be your advice to somebody with ROCD that's going out to start dating and has maybe that anticipatory anxiety and has been avoiding dating because of the dating apps and all these things? You know, when they're not in a relationship, if their their relationship OCD is around a romantic partner, I'm sure it feels great. You know, they don't have to worry about it. But how does somebody engage in a relationship knowing that the onslaught of obsessions are coming on and what would be maybe your advice from an ERP standpoint or how would somebody best prepare for that? Expect, expect doubts. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the first thing. So if you're, you know, going out, expect doubts. Don't, uh, you know, do more than one person in terms of dating because a lot of times people, you know, with, especially with the apps, you know, they continue to use the apps and continue to uh, obsess about other potential partners. So, you know, I would definitely limit the app use in terms of the time spent on using the app. And if they find the person that they want to date, you know, you go out on a date and first of all, at least three dates, unless it's a monster. Yes, yes. <laughs> You know, and, and actually focusing on getting to know the other person. And I think a lot of time, and I think especially, you know, in the dating world, a lot of times we, you know, we take first impression. We don't really spend the time getting to know the other person over the, the you know, first impression. And I think it's important that people stay and that, you know, that they accept, accept that they have thoughts about, um, you know, other potential partners that could be better. But, you know, I think in a way it's a, it's the illusion of availability. You know, so we believe that there are uh, many options and there are options, but in terms of building a relationship, you know, I think, I think it's, it's a better way to accept the fact that, you know, the, the, the fact that you think that there are many options is an illusion. And a lot of people, a lot of time people get caught in it. You know, and they they can spend. You know, we saw people that dated hundreds of people in in terms of a very uh, short uh, period of time, and you know, actually uh, got got to see people who actually said that they're starting to date people that they dated again because you know they're in the same pool already and in different websites, and they're continuing to run into each other. 
So, you know, limit yourself, limit the time you spend. You know, if you are in therapy, share it with your therapist and, and you know, not to uh, obsess together. But, <laughs> right. Know, to yeah. Ways of, of uh, you know, being able to stay at least for a while to see if, you know, you can continue or not. Um, yeah, I, I would add that to, to go, if, if you know that you have this problem, I think you should do it with, a therapist will help you. So go through it with your therapist and can, you can do the exercises and you can do the therapy throughout and that can really assist, I think. Because um, it is, anyway, it's a turbulent time. So for everyone, so um, uh, for everyone in the first dates, uh, it's quite difficult. And, you know, sometimes you want the person too much and they don't want you or the opposite. And yeah. So it's a hard Anyway, it's a hard type of interaction. So if you know that you have these, uh, these difficulties beforehand, I would suggest that you do it with, uh, with, uh, with your therapist as well. That could really help you, uh, I think. And by the way, yeah, the, the, the Tinder and uh, et cetera, and like, it's, it's, it's a great difficulty. It's a great difficulty, exactly because of- way to obsess. Yeah, a wonderful way to obsess, yeah. And I'm single in L.A., so can I just already tell you that being single in L.A. sucks when it comes to dating, so now you add the ROCD and the, the social media. What I wanted to kind of add to Madeline and maybe anybody watching this who is – you know, having some fear about getting into uh, dating and apps and everything like that. I mean, you know, Dr. Derby, you said it perfectly. And this is what I tell my clients with our OCD is you cannot go on a hundred first dates because OCD will always go in there and tell you this isn't the right person. This isn't going to work out, et cetera. You're not there to then pick your, your like forever husband or wife or, you know, partner, et cetera. So it's really going in there without thinking you need to make a judgment or make a conclusion by the end of the date, going on those at least three dates if they're safe and it's not, you know, a dangerous situation, obviously, but going on those three dates to really just, you know, be, be present, accept that those thoughts are coming in, but choosing not to engage. And it always comes back down to values, right? Like you can totally... I've had clients say, I don't date because ROCD is so bad. And you, you can make that choice. But the problem that ends up happening is you miss out on the great things about being a relationship. Plus, we know to, to get better from OCD, we have to engage with our triggers. We have to be exposed to those sensations and those experiences that trigger us. And so by being able to go on dates, it's actually a great time to do ERP. You know, obviously don't go on dates only to use use people for ERP, but it's a great kind of <laughs> side effect of, of going on these dates because you actually get to to meet the you know people and put yourself in these might, might end up being the right relationship exactly yeah <laughs> and it may work that, out may not yeah uh, exactly and i think an important thing is also um to understand that the ocd makes you um less likely to feel what you want to feel okay so or what you want to experience and i think you know, doing some behavioral experience beforehand and showing how your obsessions and your thoughts, etc., make you uh, make it more difficult for you to experience and to even assess whether you are attracted to the person or whether this person is really interesting or not, etc., because you're so much in your head. So showing that and working before that on with your therapist and learning how the the obsessions can really cheat you, yeah, and can really trick you, and can make you less likely to 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 identify even uh, if things are going well is is a really important uh, point as well. Yeah, I, I want to throw it out. I know her questions long or their questions long, so I don't know if you could fit all of it, Fran. But at five minute uh, at five oh seven. Um, Angela Marie asked a really good question. So I'll read the whole question. I don't know if it's going to fit the whole question, but um, Angela, oh, I guess Fran's amazing. Um, Angela basically says, look, I have a hard time with the scripting, uh, you know, and have very scripting, meaning these imaginal exposures and have very big emotional responses to them. And more so after the loss of my brother, did you find that loss and or trauma in history of those with ROCD being that many of us also fear loss? 
like I did, whether it's loss of what could be in a different relationship or loss if we leave. So when you've worked with these clients, when you've talked to people with ROCD, do you see, you know, sometimes having that loss or trauma component affecting the way that their ROCD manifests? And, and how would someone just like Angela kind of navigate through this process? I have two things that come to mind. Initially, when we started uh, studying ROCD, we, we started uh, interviewing people. Uh, you know, we, we invited people who, you know, thought that this is something they, they were dealing with and we interviewed them. And, and many of them described, uh, you know, traumatic family histories and uh, relational familial histories. So this is something that we saw and this is something that we address in treatment. So if, if people come with a you know, traumatic family history or with a traumatic uh, parent relationship or, or relationship with siblings, this is something that we address and we also do some processing within the therapy. And that could be you know, using uh, techniques that come from schema therapy or using um, techniques that come from uh, trauma-related work. So yes, this is something that we uh, would address. And, and the other thing that I could add is, you know, a lot of time trauma and loss uh, makes us more susceptible to strong emotions. So, you know, I think that this is something that should be addressed within the therapy. And, you know, if, if working with the scripts is difficult, you know, we would build a script that is not necessarily as difficult as the, the lovely ones I described earlier. You know, but, but starting with something easier and building it up to a point that uh, it works better. And a lot of time, if we address also the trauma history, you know, either a loss of, of somebody from the family or the traumatic family history, you know, this is something that could be addressed in the treatment. And uh, um, I think that uh, addressing it would allow better processing and better, uh, you know, the therapeutic outcome. So this is something that should be integrated into the therapy and, and you know, be taken into account. Um, I, I think uh, I can add that, you know, in CBT, in cognitive behavioral therapy, of course, ERP is very useful, but it's not the only tool. So it's also important to consider and to work with your therapist. Uh, if something is too much, um, you have other alternatives, okay? So you have behavioral experiments, various, you have cognitive kind of uh, work. So you have uh, other uh, kind of tools. So I think that's also something to consider, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question, Angela. I know, you know, with me, I had some trauma in my background and I know that that was probably played a component because I, I knew that this, I, I always wondered why did the relationship OCD feel so much louder and stronger, even though I was having intrusive thoughts about killing family members I loved or having sexual relationships with strangers or, or, or family members or, you know, when magical thinking, I, if I don't do this, I'm going to kill my mom. Like, why did this have such a stronger component? And like Angela asked, I know I had some trauma in my background and I know for me that that kind of core of not being accepted and what happens if I'm abandoned and things like that had a more real punch. So um, I'm glad that, that Angela asked that question and opened up. Um, I wanted to jump to uh, 5, 11 p.m. I am so I'm notoriously bad. I can't even pronounce my own last name, but this is Sigalit Klein. And they asked, do children with ROCD have deficits in reading social cues as an adult? They are so stuck in their loop, maybe that they miss learning opportunities. What would social training, uh, sorry, would social skills training be a benefit? So if somebody, I, I think what they're asking is like, let's say somebody has ROCD as a child and because of that, it really affects their uh, social cues and the relationships when they get older. If, is it important to, to maybe jump in with some social skills training and mislintering opportunities? I think definitely after you, you deal with the symptoms, with the obsessive compulsive symptoms. So, I think like in any kind of uh, therapy, sometimes there are things missing and so it could be communication problems, it could be social cues kind of interpretation problems, it could be other problems that come throughout uh, to light through the therapy. So yeah, it, it, 
I can imagine it can definitely hurt one's social skills if it, it develops RCD really early, yeah. I, I, What do you think, uh, Danny? I, I can add to it. Uh, I remember one of the presentations we, we did, Ofer Pellet, who is the chairman of today of the Israeli CBT Association, said to me, you know, but uh, this could be two different uh, problems. Uh, so, you know, it, it's also important to remember a lot of times, you know, OCD or relationship OCD actually colors, you know, a lot of the, the reality that the person sees. And once you clean that aside, there might be other problems that need to be addressed. And, you know, it could be that, you know, social skill training, you know, could be helpful. And it could be that if it's cleared out, you know, if you're in the relationship and you're present, it could be that your skills will improve because you're present and you're able to read the other person and read the cues and you're not in your mind. So, Yeah, and just to throw in my lived experience, two cents, um, I do agree with everything you're saying. And for what, you know, Sigalit's question, I think what, what our, our, I believe what I experienced is because my OCD started when I was younger, there were certain ways that I went about in the world because of the OCD, regardless of subtype. And when I look at, you know, in high school, when I was forming these peer relationships, the OCD would tell me the relationship OCD was like, you have to make everybody happy. Everybody has to like you. You have to have friends. If somebody stops being your friend, it's the end of the world. You have to figure out what you did. And I noticed that in my, my first relationship as well. And then what started happening is as I became an adult, I would find myself putting up with really crummy and toxic relationships because in my head, it's like, it is better to have that person in my life than not. And so I know my own kind of recovery after the ERP was really recognizing like what kind of schemas or beliefs kind of stuck around from the OCD that I want to go ahead and address to better my life because these are maladaptive behaviors to keep people around because of the fear of, of, you know, the relationship ending. Um, so I know that for me, at least it was really helpful to start to learn how to have more balanced, healthy relationships. We have so many questions and I want to get to everybody. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask is at 5 17 PM from Talia Uribe um, is fear of betrayal common in our OCD. So constantly checking whether your partner is cheating or wants to cheat through their demeanor, body language, cell phone usage, et cetera. Can it be alleviated? Amen. This question speaks to me because that was basically all my ROCD, but I'll let you two uh, answer it. You know, I think that this is one of the presentations that, uh, you know, of ROCD and, and definitely one of the domains that people obsess about. Um, so, you know, either the trustworthiness or, you know, is the partner moral enough or maybe they're, uh, they can be easily tempted by others or maybe they're weak. So these, this is a preoccupation that we see. We have many clients also that come to the clinic with, with obsessive jealousy. So that's a part of the and uh, it's the same it's the same compulsion diet uh, as with other uh, ROCD and OCD symptoms so all these uh, you know checking the demeanor checking the body language checking the cell phones you know we see people who are actually uh, put uh, some technology on the uh, partner's device to track them so all these things have to be dropped if the person want to be healed and um, I can say, I think that uh, the obsessive jealousy is definitely, you know, one of the things that uh, could make your partner distant. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of partners tell us that they, you know, they stop talking because if they talk, they might be interrogated. You know, the, the partner uh, uh, could uh, um, again and again, like question them. So they prefer not to talk and to hide things. And then if they catch them, because they hide things, they blame them that they lie. So it's a cycle that the, um, you know, the obsessive jealousy actually creates a bigger and bigger problem. And definitely something that uh, we see, uh, one of, of uh, Guy's student uh, is now studying uh, retroactive uh, jealousy. So this is another area that is being addressed. 
Yeah, I, I'll just jump in real quick before um, Professor Daron. Um, you know, what you said is so true. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy because there isn't a real reason for betrayal or the, the, the reason to think there might be some betrayal is so minimal or it was in the past. And then when we have relationship OCD, we're constantly bombarding them because we're afraid that they're going to cheat. And then what's underneath that, the, the relationship's going to be over and it's, you know, they're going to leave. Well, the problem is when you're bombarding them with 20 text messages in a row, checking the phone, asking them a bunch of questions, that those compulsions, which OCD, OCD promises you is gonna make the relationship perfect, is actually what pushes the relationship away. And then the relationship does end, and it was more so at the hands of the OCD and not the other stuff. And I just wanted to give hope to the person that asked that question. Those compulsions you list were some of my worst. I mean, I was, I was guilty of everything that you mentioned. And what we have to recognize with OCD is the more I did those, the less answers I got, the less clear I was, and the worse my relationship was off. And so when I got into healthy relationships and didn't allow our OCD to enter, I didn't do those things and we had more conversations and more trust and um, less likelihood of, of that you know, being hurt. And so, um, you know, the treatment works. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that's really important. The treatment works and you can do it at your own pace. It's all about, uh, you know, persistence and it can happen. So I think that's a really important, important point to, to raise again and again, definitely. Yeah, we have another great question. So from Addie Cohen, they ask, what will you do if the patient will start obsessing on his or her or their uh, relationship with a therapist during the treatment in ROCD? So what happens if instead, obviously we've talked about romance, we've talked about friends, we've talked about uh, you know, parent and, and son, daughter and, and, you know, and children experiences, but what about this question? What happens if it starts with the therapist? You know, the question is, uh, the, 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 does the person obsess about the therapeutic relationship? Is that the right therapist for me? Is that, uh, and I think this is something we see. I actually like to tell people I might not be the right therapist. And if you want therapy, this is something that you have to deal with. So this is the chance you have to take. And it could be the wrong therapy and the wrong therapist for you. Um, I think okay. as long as you conceptualize, oh, sorry, Danny, as long as you conceptualize it as a part of the problem, uh, I think, like Danny is saying, that's that's another manifestation of the same thing. Yeah. So you treat it in the same manner, I guess. That's what you're saying, Danny, or am I wrong? Uh, yeah, and, and you know, in, in generally, I think that the clients have to accept the doubt. And, and the, the doubt is, you know, that the partner might be the wrong partner, that they might be taking the wrong decision, and that, you know, we might be giving them the wrong therapy or might be the wrong therapist. And, and I think that's a, that's a part of the therapy and that's, you know, being able to tolerate uncertainty uh, that is important. Um, and, and another component to this question, I wonder if this also addresses Addie's question. I know for me, um, I didn't want to to upset my, I didn't realize it was ROCD, but I didn't want to ruin or upset the relationship with my therapist. I wanted my therapist to see me in a certain light. And I was afraid if I did something that that could weaken the relationship. And I reminded, I remembered when I was a kid at camp, I really liked a camp counselor and I did one thing wrong and I kept obsessing and then ruminating about, did I ruin the, you know, the counselor said I was her, you know, her favorite, uh, you know, kid that came to this camp and are they still going to think that so that's what i sometimes get as well and i can pick that up in my clients having lived through it as they start to obsess about our relationship like uh, do you still like me as a client I, I didn't do my homework are you okay are you mad at me etc and so you know the great news about that is if you're going to you know compulse anywhere it's great to do it in session with their, <laughs> your therapist because your good therapist gets to use that as the actual treatment so yeah exactly. uh, yeah, we have time for one last question and then I'm going to get your final thoughts. So I wanted to ask, there's two great questions, so I'm going to kind of blend them. So um, at 5.20 uh, p.m., uh, Sigalit asks again, like, how do you feel about ACT for ROC, uh, ROCD? So, um, you know, how do you uh, use ACT for ROCD? Like, what uh, elements of that would you find works? And then 
um, do you find that ERP also works for that? And kind of maybe just talk about a little bit about the difference and how you see either them separate or together end up being um, effective for this, this uh, subtype. You know, uh, if we the model that we're using is is cognitive behavioral, and I think we take from uh, you know very uh, different schools of thought. So we we in our model we have parts of the metacognitive model, and we have parts that are cognitive therapy, uh, and we have parts that are uh, schema therapy, and we have so we we are taking. And I think that the same thing is is with ACT, you know, uh, talking with clients about their values, you know, acceptance is an important part, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the, the current relationship, the future. So in a way, acceptance is an important component as well. Uh, you know, separately as a therapy for our OCD, I, I, I don't think we can tell because there are no studies yet to check that. Um, but th that's definitely one therapy. If I think that if it's informed about our OCD, if the therapist is informed, you know, that's definitely another way of accessing these obsessions and dealing with them. Um, yeah. I Did you have any right. idea? Okay. Yeah. And I, I was just going to throw out there too. I always think that using an ACT approach can always help because it comes back down to what is important to you. You know, if somebody says like, for me, like I want to be in a relationship, I want to get married, I want to have, you know, children. And so I can absolutely give into my fear and none of those things will happen. But if those values mean so much to me, I'm willing to take the discomfort that may come from a relationship because of our, you know, my ROCD and, it's, it's going to be worth it. it. It makes sense and it pays off. Um, speaking about ROCD, I'm gonna have ROCD now because I didn't get to everybody's questions. I'm gonna feel <laughs> absolutely terrible. Um, I have to shout out Madeline Baker because they are also single in LA, so they understand my pain. I wanna shout out a fellow um, lead advocate for the IOCDF with me, Valerie Andrews, who keeps uh, saying how great you, you both are doing. So I just wanted to thank that. Um, what I would love to hear from both of you before uh, we kind of close is what would be some final thoughts? You know, people watching this um, have relationship OCD or they think they may have it. What would, if you could kind of sum up, I know it's hard, right? A decade of work, but if you could sum up everything that you've done, your research and, and your, your clinical experience, what would be that like final thought for people watching right now? Maybe you can start Dr. Derby um, for everybody watching right now. What kind of message do you want to maybe leave them with? You know, a, mess of, a message of hope, you know, this is something treatable, you know, you can change it if, you know, if you um, find a therapist who is informed about our OCD, and if you don't have a therapist who is informed, you know, find a therapist who is willing to learn about it, introduce him to the materials. You know, our experience is that, that people, you know, uh, reach out and they consult and they find therapists and we had consultations with therapists a lot of time we introduce people to the materials you know the dissemination of the knowledge is important and and you know this is something you know the way i see it uh, uh this is not something that you have to uh, continue to live it and it will uh, you know take over your relational future agreed how for you professor duran uh, uh he said it perfectly i have nothing to add <laughs> yeah you guys are like the same working brain at times so um absolutely well i i guess my final message for everybody watching is like ask somebody that has relation you know ocd and, and struggled with severe relationship ocd i do want to give everybody hope i mean i really did not want to date after my first relationship that my first real relationship um, because of how bad it was, but utilizing exposure response prevention. Also, obviously we talked about ACT and just living values. I was able to identify obsessions. I was able to identify compulsions. And because of that work that I did, my relationships after that were healthy. I mean, I'm not gonna pretend they were gl glorious, um, even though as we acknowledged earlier, I'm perfect. It was more my, my partner's <laughs> problems, but no, I'm just kidding. But um, I, I was able to get healthy and have great relationships. And now I'm optimistic that I can reach those goals. So I didn't have anything special. I was able to do it. So I know that you guys can too. I want to absolutely thank both of my guests. I mean, you guys really don't, you know, it, it, I was, I was really excited when 
um, you know, I was able to to be part of this panel because, like I said, I mean, I really did not know relationship OCD existed. I suffered for many years with that because of not knowing what it was. And it wasn't until working with the International OCD Foundation and they put out your research and the things that you did for, for identifying this subtype that really helped me identify my own relationship OCD and the work that you both are doing is gonna really help a lot of people struggling. So thank you both so much. Appreciate thank you, it was wonderful. Thank you, thank you. for sharing yeah. uh, about your lived experience. Yeah, no, thank you. I This was amazing. And obviously this subtype is so important. I know it affects a lot of people. So thank you so much because I know uh, the time in your country right now, it's like in the middle of the night. So for both of you to <laughs> be a part of it, it's incredible. I wanna remind everybody this was recorded. So if you watch some of this live, but wanna see the entire thing, make sure that you uh, watch it on all of ISDF's platforms. You can go to YouTube and Facebook and other platforms and they definitely have this video up in its entirety up. If you have any questions about anything, uh, the best place to go would be the International OCD Foundation. You can email them, they're very accessible. They'd love to get back to you. Make sure to go to IOCDF, uh, sorry, info at IOCDF.org. Um, you can also go to IOCDF.org slash peace of mind. That's gonna have all the upcoming programming. So not only obviously do we talk about relationship OCD, but there's so many other things that are important with OCD and related disorders. So make sure to go there to find out the uh, future um, you know, live streams. Thank you so much to everybody watching and being part of this incredible OCD and related disorders community. Um, please reach out to the IOCDF. We'd love to hear um, from everyone and continue to give you programming that that helps you out and answers those questions that you have. To everybody's question I didn't get to, I really, really am sad. So uh, please email the IOCDF so we can do that. I wanna give one shout out obviously to all the people at the IOCDF that are in the behind the scenes that made this possible. Shout out to Ethan. I didn't do as well as you, I can never, but uh, thank you for having me step in. And of course, to, to my new Israeli friends, um, have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you for your knowledge and thank you so much to everybody who watched. Take care, have a wonderful rest of your day and join us back here. Uh, for IOCS virtual programming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.